everybody. This is David of half the team of Rush Vibes here. Um, one, I apologize. I'm a little under the weather. And you'll also notice that I'm flying solo uh, this evening. I guess we've gone 46, 47 episodes uh, tandem. Jessica, myself, as you guys know, my lovely wife is expecting. And um, unfortunately, we're toward the end of that process. So she just didn't have an enter to record tonight. So I'm holding it down solo, bringing you Rush Vibes, still going. Uh, we got, I think we still got a couple more episodes in us. But we wanted to get in front of you guys tonight because we have a very, 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 very special guest. Um, someone who I've known at this point, I'm going to embarrass myself, probably at least 2008. I, I can't do math. A long time. Probably more than, definitely more than 10 years. Um, and it's also someone who played a very important role uh, last summer in his local town, uh, bringing the news to people when a lot of demonstrations and organizing was going on. And he played a very instrumental role. And I think it all happened just on a whim because he happened to be going to get some ice cream and, and caught a, uh, a demonstration going by on his, on his camera phone. So uh, really excited um, to bring our guest in, which is Sir Matt Henson of Maddie Media based in Asheville, North Carolina. So Matt, welcome to uh, Rush Vibes. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to finally be here and uh, make my appearance. I've been waiting patiently and uh, I'm excited to get in right before the wrap up of the first season. Yeah, what a lot of people don't know is Matt was, I think, supposed to be one of our first guests. <laughs> <laughs> and um, here we are. So how many of our guests later, um, however many episodes later, we're finally getting him on. We wanted to do it in person. Um, unfortunately, it, it didn't work out that way. But at least we got you here. Um, we got you in front of the Vibe Tribe. So that's really, really all that matters. And you get to tell your story, which I think is honestly no bias. I think it's, I think it's amazing. So I can't wait for you to share it with all the, the listeners and the viewers. So right before we get, in, get into uh, a little bit more about you and, and what you're doing now, I'll let everybody know, um, subscribe, like, uh, give this on YouTube. We've actually added like eight, nine subscribers, I think, in the last few weeks. Likely uh, thanks to uh, the awesome guests that we had, Leah and uh, Stephanie, and then little little big brother Alan, um, spreading it with their with their uh, their networks. So we appreciate everybody who subscribed and joined. But please do continue to share. Um, and as you come across the videos, you know, please uh, be sure to like them and, and check out some of the old ones too. Also, uh, most of the one out of two of the kids are in bed, so I don't know if the other one is going to sneak downstairs behind me. So I apologize if that's the case, if that's what happens. Um, and hopefully you won't hear my wife hacking her life away upstairs either. Um, she's, she's really battling a bad cough. But assuming none of that happens, we can get to the show as normal. So, um, so Matt, uh, a, little bit of, uh, a little bit of background. I can't, I can't spoil it because obviously I, I know a lot of it about, a lot about you. Um, but Maddie Media is your, is your company. And I won't, I won't speak for you, but I know it's, it's basically... Uh, it's kind of a, a one-stop shop for content creation, um, mm -hmm. content curating, and also I know you do a lot of uh, photography, and then you also do a lot of uh, SEO work with small businesses and stuff. So go ahead and give a little bit of background about what Maddie Media is, um, what you're doing, the clients that you serve, and then we can get more into your background, what you did before this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, basically, uh, I am kind of, a like you said, a one-stop shop um for photography needs video needs uh website uh hosting management um creation of websites design and uh yeah a lot of seo work that's kind of uh the focus right now um is is a lot i'm doing more seo work than probably anything else right now um and it's uh it's it's taken off things are starting to look up um and uh, going through those those small business growth spurts that you kind of have to suffer through, yeah. Um, and and learning the ropes and how to to manage a business and uh, learning that most of managing a business is not doing the stuff that you like. It's learning to love the stuff that grows your business: the marketing, the paperwork, the the financials, and and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, we're excited for next year. Um, definitely excited to see where things are going, um, and and see that light at the end of the tunnel as things are starting to grow and really take off. So pretty now, excited. 
Now, what you're doing now is specifically like the SEO work and, and helping small businesses grow their, their footprint online and then um, mm-hmm. helping them with their reach. Is that something that you went to school for or is that something that you kind of had to teach yourself, um, like, you know, just kind of go to YouTube University or, or take various courses to, to learn how to do? Yeah, um, YouTube University. Uh, I feel like that's where I've learned probably 90% of my post school education has come from YouTube University. Um, and believe it or not, Google is a great tool. Um, and they offer a lot of free classes. Google wants you to learn how to market yourself. They want you to learn how to use those tools they offer for free. And uh, so it's just taking the time to dive into that and learn. And uh, uh, a lot of it's got to do with the environment. You know, where I live in Asheville, North Carolina, uh, it's very small business oriented. Uh, yeah. A lot of a lot of startups, a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, I saw a need there um, for businesses that are starting up that have their hands full. Mm-hmm work don't have time to sit down and necessarily market themselves and uh i I think that's an opportunity for myself to step in and offer that piece of their puzzle um to help them grow as well so yeah of course google wants you to take stuff so you can uh start using their adsense platform once you uh (laughs) once you start running your own (laughs) business so um i'm 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 very i'm very positive that that that's kind of how they how they funnel people who take their courses but no google is absolutely absolutely a fantastic resource for anything that you want to do. Mm-hmm. Usually they, they have a lot of free resources that you can, uh, that you can utilize. So, uh, so self-taught is pretty cool. Um, mm-hmm. and, and have a, a huge appreciation for it as someone who's learned kind of how to run a podcast, book video and audio and, and kind of learn how to do thumbnails. And, um, I have some friends who are designer friends and they haven't told me what I suspect is that my thumbnails could use some work. So I'm always trying to tinker with those and, and make them better. But just seeing where they were net were at the beginning to where they've come now, they're a lot more streamlined, a lot more succinct. So I can definitely mm-hmm. appreciate what it's like to try to teach yourself a skill while you're working on that skill. And it's, it's definitely not, not something that's, that's easy or a lot of people can, can do comfortably. So what did you do? Um, talk about your background a little bit. What did you do before you landed um, or you, before you created Maddie Media with some of the things that you were doing? Um, a good portion of my background from high school um, up until a couple of years ago was spent mostly in mental health. Um, I worked hands on in a couple of facilities with uh, youth. Uh, most of my work has been 18 and under, um, mostly teenage boys. I ran uh, group homes for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had two locations that were about an hour and a half apart um, that worked specifically with uh, behavior side of mental health. So a lot of, uh, oppositional defiant type disorder conduct stuff, um, and just working on, uh, integrating youth back into their communities and, um, teaching them the life skills they need. A lot of these kids were coming from, you know, backgrounds where they necessarily didn't have access to, you know, basic skills that a lot of us take for granted, you know, just simple things like tying their shoes and and taking a bath to learning how to cook and do their homework and manage their time. Um, So I spent a lot of time in the mental health field and, uh, and I would say that's probably been 80% of my employment since I graduated high school. So I want to see how you may have said this. Sorry. I I may have dozed out. It's it's probably the bourbon hitting me, but uh, (laughs) how, how long did you do that? Uh, let's see. I started mental health right after I left Greensboro college. So shout, like out, 2000, to the, shout out to the pride, shout out to GC. Uh, let's see. I started a, a level four facility in 2010. Yeah. And, uh, I did that for a couple of years, maybe two years. And then, uh, I was offered a position to run uh, a group home, which had, uh, four boys in it. And I did that for about seven years total opening another home with a company out of Gastonia called uh, steps for success. So, Okay. Uh, you know, shout out to those guys local to you. Uh, they have a couple homes in your area, a couple homes here and uh, yeah. great program, um, very successful program. And uh, it was great to be a part of that organization as they grew and, uh, and, uh, and benefited my community. You know, a lot of the kids are local. Yeah. They come from, from local homes and places like that. So you're, you're really working in your community to, uh, to help these kids go in and lead a normal life. Yeah. So you're, um, you're kind of like the, the third guest in a row that we've had who has some sort of, um, can, can give a, a professional opinion, so to speak, on, on mental health and its importance. And I, and I think, um, I don't want to speak for you, but at least in my perspective, how uh, overlooked it is, even in, in today's world where, you know, you, if you, especially if you look at like corporate uh, speak, it's, it's jobs are always like, oh, mental health, take care of your mental health, take care of your mental health. But I, I still feel like it's more of a buzzword. Um, mm-hmm. now and, and not something that people like 
one would truly understand, uh, which means they also don't understand the importance of it. Uh, what What are your thoughts on on mental health? Say, like, because you, I know you you recently left um, a, a pretty big company, um, and you know some of the things you see in terms of like work life balance and and some of the mm-hmm. things that are asked of of the day to day professionals. Like, how do you do you feel like companies and people are treating it with the importance it needs, or do you think that we still have, you know, like a long way to go in general? Um, I think COVID really opened a a can of worms on the mental health side of day-to-day life. Um, The the everyday stresses that a lot of people go through that they never talk about, um, you know, there's always been a stigma with mental health that if you're feeling some kind of different way, depression or anxiety, that there's something quote unquote wrong with you or that you're not functioning right, or you've got an an issue. And in reality, I think everybody experiences some kind of mental health issue on a day-to-day basis. We all have stresses. We all have anxieties. We all have things that bring us down and lift us up. And uh, for me working in mental health, um, and growing up in the nineties and things where you didn't talk about that kind of stuff, especially as a, as a man, yeah. uh, really helped me to open up and kind of start exploring my personal traumas and, and things like that. And, and really exploring, you know, how those things affect your day to day behaviors. You don't realize yeah. it, but you know, anxiety can, can affect you on a day to day basis. And if you don't take the time to look at it 10 or 15 years down the road, you could be in shambles, yeah. you know? And it can really affect your life. And I think COVID and and people, you know, stepping away from careers and the increase in access to mental health was a Mm -hmm. big deal. You saw a lot of the virtual virtual therapy. You saw the price of therapy nosedive across the board in the United States for the first time in a long time. Uh, You see local programs, local communities, local governments starting to bring those funds out of other areas to encourage people to go and just sit down and talk yeah, and, and you know, make sure that you're running at your best. Um, Mm -hmm. and so, yeah, I think, uh, uh, over the last year, year and a half, um, mental health has definitely, uh, come to the forefront. I think it's still a buzzword in a lot of areas. Sure. Um, I think big corporations are really starting to see that, encouraging their employees to work on their mental health is actually going to make more productive employees also. Yeah. Um, which isn't, shouldn't be the reason you want your employees to go receive mental health <laughs> treatment to make them more productive. You should care about right. them, but well, you a should. lot of companies are realizing yeah. that if they offer these services, it can make their employees more productive and, and make them happier, which leads to employee retention. So, yeah. Oh, so, so what are some things that you do? Cause, um, I mean, obviously being, being experienced in the, in the space, um, even at your last, your last, I guess, job you had before you, mm-hmm. you, know, you set out to work on your own. And even now, uh, I mean, cause life didn't get any easier. I imagine we'll talk about that, uh, right. especially when you become an entrepreneur. So what are some steps you take day to day or just whenever you feel yourself getting overwhelmed or you feel that anxiety kind of creeping in, what are some steps you take to kind of, to kind of take that, that step back and, and kind of relax yourself? Um, I think journaling is a really big um, key, it, and it's one of the easiest things to do. Sometimes we have so much going on, and you, you can kind of relate having kids and having to go to work and having to yeah. maintain a relationship and find time for your hobbies. You you have so much going on that you don't take the time to sit down and sort your thoughts out and figure out what's actually causing your stress and your anxiety. Sometimes I say, oh, my my kids are stressing me out. And then you, yeah. you sit down and you write it out in a journal and you realize, no, work is stressing me out and I'm letting that leak into my children or into my relationship. So I think having a journal um, and and realizing that in 2021, a journal does not have to be a notebook and a piece of paper. There are yeah. apps. There are um, all, all kinds of apps on Android, Google Play, and, and uh, Apple Play Store, Apple Store, there are all kinds of journaling apps. It's just, mental it's just, health apps. It's just, it's just the app store. The app store, excuse me. The app um, store. I need you to come correct, sir. You talk about Apple. Still learning my Apple, uh, <laughs> Apple terminology. Um, but just having somewhere that you can write a thought down and yeah. say, I'm going to come back to this later because by the time we get to bed, you're ready to go to bed. You're not ready right. to really sit down and think. But if you can just take that extra 30 seconds and write that down and come back to it later, um, I've noticed for me that I can kind of sort through it. And by the time I go to bed, um, 
the weight of those problems and sorting through them before I go to bed helps me feel a little bit better. So yeah. journaling and I think taking time to find a passion and putting time into that passion and putting time away for yourself every day um, and not not you and your kids, not you and your spouse, but just yourself, yeah. you know, even if it's 15 minutes, 20 sure. minutes a day, just finding something you enjoy doing that truly yeah. brings you joy and spending time doing that cooking you know, taking pictures, working on your podcast, editing videos, whatever that is. Cigars. Um, cigars, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. I mean, uh, just having that time built into your day every day and yeah. dedicate yourself to it, I think uh, can go a long way. So, yeah. So uh, I'll tell you, um, probably one of the, the top five tribe members um, and, and most avid listeners is my mom. And I know you know my mom and she was probably... Ooh beaming from from ear to ear that you said journaling because i know growing up that's all she ever encouraged me to do was to journal my thoughts and you know just because you go through life and you're not going to remember everything right mm -hmm. so not so much as it is therapeutic but just you know you these things happen to you you have these experiences and you want to be able to uh, mm -hmm. recall them years down the road when when your memory fails you so i wish she was always telling me right even now she'll still encourage me to uh, to write. And my wife, uh, Jessica, as well, she's always like, oh, you should journal. Because you know, I've had a pretty pretty rough, you know, 18 months, as, as most people have. And, mm -hmm. and she's she's constantly, Jessica's constantly told me, oh, maybe you should start journaling. Maybe you should start journaling. I'm like, yeah, whatever. But I, I, I do know that when I when I do write, you're absolutely right. And you kind of escape, right? Like mm -hmm. if you're just in a, in a spot where you can focus on just the pen and the paper or the keys and the in the screen or if you want to speak audibly to to a device and let it dictate for you or transcribe for you um you you kind of it becomes a, a release um and yep. you kind of escape the world in your current circumstances for a while so i know i know doris is gonna uh, appreciate the fact that that you <laughs> said to journal and, and i know jessica will as well speaking of my wife i just want to i just want to hold the headphones up that she normally wears just to let everybody know that you know we're <laughs> We're holding her up in, in, in spirit, good spirit, because she's not feeling well enough to, to record. So I love you. I love you, Jess. <laughs> get, get better soon. Um, so what uh, what were you doing? You don't have to name the company specifically um, for, for a number of reasons. <laughs> but, uh, what, were you, uh, what were you doing uh, work-wise uh, when you decided to make this shift to – Hey, I want to kind of go out on my own, do my own thing, learn some new skills and be able to, uh, you know, have some, you know, provide for my livelihood off of these skills. So what, what were you kind of doing? What was life like for you when you made that, that transition? Uh, I was working for a company that had, um, shifted everybody to mostly remote work. Um, you know, obviously at the beginning of COVID, um, so this is 20, 2020, right? Yes. Yeah. I think it was March. Actually, I remember it to this day. It was the day the uh, Utah Jazz game got canceled. It was the next day. Oh, yeah. Um, that, was a big, that was a big day. We got the big phone call. Uh, we had to cancel all of our in-person appointments, and basically we were grounded. Uh, and about three days later, we had a giant meeting, and basically it was, hey, our entire company is shifting to remote work. Uh, buckle up. We're going to see how this goes. And yeah. Basically, for the next year, I would say year and some change, we were working remotely, and I just had a, a lot of stuff going on in that time um, over that course of that year that made me realize that uh, I was I was in a position to take a risk. And I think mm -hmm. COVID in general and the kind of attitudes that developed nationwide pushed me a little bit as well. A lot of people took the time from COVID to start their own jobs, start their own businesses. And yeah. uh, so then me just said, hey, you know, I think you're ready for this. Um, and I just kind of said, you know, I'm going to take this leap of faith and and put some trust in myself and, and take a risk. Because mm -hmm. um, I've always been a, a kind of nine to five person, yeah. hold a steady job, look for steady paycheck and steady benefits. And uh, I just said, you know, if I'm going to try this, I don't have you know, all this time left. I don't want to wait till I'm in my fifties or sixties and try to do this. So, um, I want to do it now. While I've got the energy to try it. And, uh, while I've got the opportunity. And so I, I stepped away from a, a full-time job and said, uh, let's see what happens yeah. <laughs> for lack of a better word. It was yeah. just kind of, let's see what happens. Do you think you would have made the leap if not for COVID? Ooh, uh, 
that's tough. That's a tough question. And that's what, um, we, that's what we do here at Rush Fives. We ask the tough questions. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I was because prior to COVID and the way things are going for my job, I wasn't necessarily unhappy with my job. Yeah. Um, I, things were running smoothly. Um, my particular job and the area in which I worked was doing fantastic. Um, so I wasn't necessarily unhappy at all. I was, I was very happy with what I was doing. Yeah. And, um, so I don't know, I don't know, maybe not, maybe, maybe COVID was that, that opening that I needed to kind of say, Hey, maybe, maybe this isn't what I'm going to keep doing. Um, yeah. yeah, that's, I don't know. I don't really, I really don't know. I think COVID was probably the, the opening in the door that I needed to step through. Um, had it not happened, there's a good chance I'd probably still be there. Yeah, you know the same thing I was doing because I wasn't I wasn't unhappy. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I can definitely uh, I can relate. Maybe not in necessarily in a in a revenue sense, in a money making sense, but you know, this podcast was was born out of the fact that Jessica and I were in the house, and you know, we didn't have a lot of creative outlets. Um, mm-hmm. And the one thing that we kind of always had always toyed with the idea of is doing a podcast. I think in her mind, it was probably more so audio than than video. Uh, mm-hmm. me, you know, being ad, you know, I, I watched the breakfast club a lot. I, I've always enjoyed the, uh, the talk, the sit down and, and have conversation type talk shows, you know, where you have guests come mm-hmm. on or someone can sit and speak directly to the camera and deliver a monologue. I've always had an appreciation for those, those types of mediums. So it was like, Hey, this is clearly going to last longer than two weeks. Right. <laughs> Everybody yeah. said they thought they were going to go on for two weeks and then the pandemic would be over. Um, we're obviously going to be in the house a lot longer than that. You know, why not just try something new? And for us, the podcast serves as a vehicle for a number of different things, right? Like one, it's an opportunity to see where it goes. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity for us to kind of have a date night, built in date night. Kids go to bed. We turn the lights on, we hit record and we just talk. Um, And then it's also, you know, it's the opportunity to have, you know, a platform and I'm learning new things. Jess is learning Mm -hmm. things and, and it's just, it's it's a lot of different things in one. Um, But, if not for being at home, you know, 24 seven for, for a good bit of last year, you know, I don't know that we would have had one the time or the motivation to really do it. And I can't, I can't imagine my life now without rush vibes. Like this is a part of, of who, yeah. for me, this is part of my makeup. It's part of my DNA. Like I love doing this, right? Like putting this, the setup, the editing, the make mixing, matching, like whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I love it. And haven't seen a dime from it yet and may never, but I, it doesn't matter. I absolutely love it. So like you said, finding those passions. Um, so it's like COVID is a nasty thing. It's taken life from a lot of people and destroyed life for those who, who were left of those loved ones who they've lost. Um, and it's caused economies to, to shift and people to lose jobs and, you know, whatever. But, you know, there's still some good that have, that has kind of come out of it. And yep. I think um, it's, it's kind of yucky to, to say thanks to COVID they, I have this great thing because there's so much loss associated with it. But um, yeah, I, I just don't know that we'd be sitting here having this conversation if not for, uh, mm-hmm. you know, for the pandemic. So I guess for that, I'm grateful, but still kind of an uncomfortable, uncomfortable thing to say. Yeah. Uh, um, so I do want to talk about it. Uh, speaking of the, the big thing that happened around this time, uh, that that also kind of helped you make the uh, the jump to Manny Media. I want to get into that specifically and, and kind of get your thoughts on what life was like for you because I was, I had a I had a, uh, a fr- <laughs> I had a front row seat to it all. I was I was watching the the live videos on Facebook every night, um, but I, I want you to be able to kind of kind of relive it for everybody. But before we do that, um, I do want to take a quick break because that's what we do here. Rush Five, we take a break, give people a chance, go get a drink, refresh, whatever. Um, so we'll do that. We'll come back and then we'll uh, we'll get into more with uh, Matt Henson from Maddie Media. So we'll be right back. All right, so we're back with uh, with Matt Henson from from Maddie Media, and um, I was I was getting ready to tell him a joke, and I decided not to say it because I wanted to save it for when we're live, and I wanted his reaction to be authentic. But the way you have your mic and your and your uh, what, what's it called the splat the the thing that catches uh, the pop screen the pop screen situated is you have a, a very Wilson look going on from your home improvement when he was covered by the, by the fence. So I can only see like, <laughs> like half your face. So I know a lot of people are looking like, I don't even know what dude looks like. Cause he's got the, he's got the, I don't want you to adjust your setup. I just want to let you know oh, you're good. that you, you got a very Wilson, you know, shout out to Wilson. Maybe, I don't know if he's dead, but if he is rest in peace. Um, I love Wilson. 
So um, summer 2020, you're working for this company. I want to set the table. That's what, that's what I do here. So hopefully you'll allow me to set the table. Uh, summer 2020, you're working for a company, really big company, global company. Mm-hmm. And um, I guess this is this is a day of the week. I don't, I don't know if the shutdown had already happened or not or, or what. I'm, I think it had. Yeah, it so had. You were you working remotely. So mm-hmm. you are walking downtown Asheville, right? And mm-hmm. you're going... <laughs> You're going to get some ice cream. There's nothing wrong with yeah. that. You know, grown, grown men go to get ice cream. I go to get ice cream all the time. Uh, and shout out to Marble Slab. <laughs> yeah, shout out. She goes, not for you guys. This this next part wouldn't have happened. Um, and you're, I think, as you're walking to the ice cream restaurant or after you've gotten your ice cream, you see this, this demonstration going down one of the main streets, right? Mm-hmm. And um, you break out your phone and you start recording. Go mm-hmm. to Facebook Live a service which you've never used before. You've been on Facebook, but you've never gone live before. Mm-hmm. And you happen to go live and start walking with the crowd recording it. And this actually happens to be one of the, is it fair to say one of the first protests in Asheville the summer of, of 2020? It was, the, first. Well, it was mm-hmm. the actual first protest in mm-hmm. Asheville, North Carolina, the summer of 2020, um, obviously spurred by the events of, of George Floyd, the George Floyd murder that was captured on, on camera um, among um, Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and a lot of other things that happened um, that, that summer or news that, that broke that summer. And you just start filming, right? So mm-hmm. I don't want to tell the whole story. I want you to take it from here, but I just kind of wanted to set the scene for everybody. So you're, you, start, you start walking with the crowd and you're filming and then, and then what happens from there? Um, yeah, the whole day itself is, is an interesting story because I had actually been traveling the entire day before that. I had decided I was just going to go spend the day in nature. It was a Sunday um, so I had driven the entirety of the Blue Ridge Parkway, gone all the way into Tennessee that morning. Um, this is May 31st, um, and this is about six days after the uh, George Floyd was murdered. And, uh, yeah, I was on the way home. It was about 6 in the afternoon, and I was like, man, I want some ice cream. I'm, I'm going to swing by the spot. I'm going to grab some ice cream on my way home, and I was going to go home and get ready for the work day tomorrow, yeah. the next day. And, um yeah, I had, uh, as I as I went to park, uh, the central part of downtown Asheville is a place called uh, Vance Monument, Vance, Vance Pack Square. Yeah. Uh, the monument's actually no longer there. It's been taken down and removed. Um, and I noticed a large crowd gathering, and I, I hadn't read a report of anything like this was going on. Uh, it was just kind of, hey, what, what are they doing over there? So I, I yeah. walked over and uh, began to hear... Um, and see the signs and hear some of the uh, chants. And yeah, like you said, I'd never been on Facebook Live before and something just clicked in my head and said, hey, this this might be a pretty big deal. This is one of the larger crowds I've ever seen in in my town for for a non-sanctioned, non-organized event. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I got on, I, I threw up a simple label um, and uh, started to follow the group and kind of, um, and, and, uh, follow and, and followed around. Cause it was, it was a large area. It takes up about a block. So I'd been walking around and I was filming and then the group started to move through town. So I just started walking with them. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And then it ended up unfolding into about a seven or eight hour, probably longer event. I think I got home about four o'clock in the morning after everything was all said and done. Yeah. Um, and, uh, as you, as you remember very well, uh, the night turned into, uh, chaos. Um, yep. uh, and, uh, so yeah, the group ended up uh, moving down, uh, through downtown onto one of the local highway, one of the local freeways, a very busy freeway. Um, and again, none of this was, uh, per- was, was under permit or sanctioned. This was a spur of the moment event and we're probably talking three to 4,000 people um taking up this highway and it was in protest of of what had happened to george floyd and police yeah. brutality um and it was i think it was especially triggered because there had been some events in Asheville over the last couple of years uh there was a, a gentleman that was assaulted by a cop for jaywalking uh on a street at two o'clock in the morning with no cars he yeah. was arrested and assaulted there was another individual that was shot and uh he was left to to, to basically dive over the course of a few hours, um, without any assistance. So I think some of the things in our community 
um, with the addition of what had happened with George Floyd triggered this event. Yeah. And, um, and then police got involved about four hours after I started filming. And um, that's when we started to see tear gas and, and rubber bullets or, or pepper pepper bullets. And uh, yeah. first time I'd ever been tear gassed. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think uh, that that night went pretty crazy. Um, and the uh, next thing I know, I think I was actually chatting with you via the, the comments because I didn't really know how to operate <laughs> Facebook live and how all that worked. Oh, and the next thing I know, somebody said, hey, you've got 12,000 people, 13,000 people, 20,000 people watching this thing. No, oh, those comments were, they were live. <laughs> yeah. They were, they were live. Um, and there was a lot of people in there saying a lot of, a lot of different things. Um, and, it, and it was interesting watching it because, like you said, um, I mean, everybody, most people who have been on Facebook have seen a live recording. Mm-hmm. Uh, usually it's, you know, baby shower, gender reveal, people out on a boat, out on like mm-hmm. on, on a lake or something, you know, just vanity. Hey, look at me, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, the summer and it's kind of like a perfect storm, right? Like everybody's mm-hmm. in the house. Um, you know, all these different cities and towns, they, and they have mandates and pe- some people can't go out and some other places, some people can, but only for certain things. So it was like the perfect time for something like this to happen, um, mm-hmm. in terms of like you recording it. And then a lot of people seeing it because people just, they're at the house. And so, yeah. you know, how the Facebook algorithm works, if enough people are watching it and there's enough, um, activity on the video or a certain kind of activity, it's going to go crazy. And I remember watching, like it started with like, Six, because you know it said, "Oh, Matt Henson's going live." I'm like, "What the hell is Matt doing going like Matt doesn't go live? Like, what is like what is he doing?" And then I see people marching. I'm like, "Oh shit!" Like he's at a, he's at a demonstration, um, and then it's like twelve people, twenty people, eighty people, yeah, one hundred and fifty, two hundred, and it's like it literally just keeps going up. And as the 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 tension starts rising, um, and at the point where the where the where the gas got got shot or dispersed on the crowd. I'm over here ducking on the, I'm ducking like the canisters are, are flying at me because it's like a live, it's like a, like zero dark 30, like one of those action movies where their stuff is flying and, you know, and the, mm-hmm. I'm like, no, oh, oh, like this is real life. Like this is my friend out there in, in arm's way, but he's filming so people can kind of see what's going on. Mm-hmm. And I remember hearing you trying to, trying to like gather yourself after, you know, being exposed to the, to the smoke. And I'm like, like, oh shit, is he about to die? <laughs> <laughs> like is he is he is he gonna make it? Is he gonna be all right? But I, I think one thing that's crazy about that night is number one, you realize them cloth masks, them cloth masks weren't gonna do a damn thing against uh, tear gas. But no. also, um, how quickly I think it was it was either before or after I can was it before or after that where people, um, the cops and some of the the lead demonstrators got together and tried to have an understanding. Was it after um, that the gas was was released on the crowd or was it before that? Uh, it was after the first wave of gas was released that okay. afternoon. And um, what had happened is essentially somebody had started throwing rocks. They had formed a bright shield line because yeah. the group was approaching a really dangerous part of the intersection where it splits off into a downtown area yeah. or it splits off towards another large highway. And they had kind of formed a line and said, hey, for the safety of your group, you guys can't go past this point. Right. And I think what had happened initially was somebody started throwing rocks. So they responded. And yeah. then there was a moment where everybody said, all right, the guy throwing the rocks is out of here. They, they stopped shooting the rubber bullets and then the tear gas. And they said, Hey, let's talk for a few minutes. And, um, I was able to be there and hear that conversation. I actually, yeah, I remember that, that yeah. uh, the gentleman that was speaking with the cops was a, a guy that I'd played basketball with for years. Yeah. Um, so seeing a member of my community that I knew step up, you know, a young guy, and initiate those conversations because there were kids in the crowd. Initially, this was a very peaceful event. Yeah. So when the first tear gas canister came out, there were kids, you yeah. know, as little as five. I have, I remember uh, one girl specifically, a little girl, maybe six or seven years old. Specifically, I remember her being swept up and somebody just sprinting down the highway with this little girl. Yeah. And, uh, you know, an hour earlier, I had heard her cheering, you know, Black Lives Matter. And it was like, this is serious. This yeah. is this is a big deal now. This isn't just a small demonstration anymore. Like, you know, we're in the middle of something very big. Yeah. Um, 
And then, yeah, and then uh, after that initial meeting with the police, there was kind of an agreement to everybody to get off the highway and move back into the downtown area. Mm-hmm. And then things just just went absolutely into chaos. So what, what's going through your mind when this is happening, right? Like, so this is something you're, this is a, a, a protest or, or rally demonstration that you're at by chance, right? Like mm-hmm. you just happen to cross the pass at the time that the, that the group is, is making its way down toward this, this destination. And mm-hmm. you're filming... So obviously isn't something that you've done normally or regularly. And then you, you, and, and I feel like in, in, in certain moments you can kind of feel the things shift, right. Where yeah. you're like, okay, this is going a certain kind of way. So in your, in the back of your mind, like what's like, what, what's, what are you thinking as, as you start to see like the tensions rise, people getting antsy, things getting thrown and then, Oh my God, like there's gas, there's tear gas, like dispersing, like right in front of me. Like, what was that like for you? Um, it was, it was a weird combination of emotions because your natural, your natural instincts kick in and you want to get out of there. Yeah. You're like, this is becoming dangerous. I need to go. But then you see like, there was a lot of people watching this that can't be here and they want to know what's going on. And if I leave, I may miss an opportunity to bring important information forward to the community or let them see something that is affecting their community. I mean, this affected the entire county, the entire city, and all of the areas around it. Um, and so there was uh, it's it's mixed emotions because you want to take care of yourself and make sure that you're safe. Um, and I don't know if maybe it was the mental health background and being in a lot of different crisis situations and kind of knowing how to talk to yourself yeah. um, and, and kind of knowing how to calm yourself down and say, all right, you know, this is tear gas. You're not going to die. It's not going to kill you. Be a little bit safer about where you're at and what you're around, but keep going, you know, something yeah. just said keep going. And, you know, I had a lot of support from people like yourself and Jess and, and uh, others close to me that were saying, Hey, you know, if you need anything, let us know. Um, so yeah, I just, I just kind of said, Hey, I think I'm going to be okay. Um, I've got the wherewithal to know and be aware of my surroundings and know if it does get to a point where, where it's, really dangerous to get out of there yeah. or to get, to get distance and get separation. So, yeah. and you definitely kept going because uh, there were a lot of demonstrations in Nashville <laughs> and you were at pretty much every single one of them. Um, mm-hmm. And you, your presence on Facebook, I think, I don't know if it was after that first night or after the first couple of nights, I think your, your friend request uh, inbox was just like bananas, right? Like then you get like over like 2000 or some friend requests. Yeah, it was uh, so Facebook maxed you out at 999 requests at a time. Yeah. So it was to the point where it was like I would just go through and mass delete all the requests. <laughs> and it, you know, a couple of hours would go by cuz I was still working my job during the day. Yeah. Like Monday morning I got up after being tear gassed at 9 a.m. and went into a Zoom meeting at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, my eyes are puffy and swollen it looks like i've been crying Uh, everybody's hey are you okay are you sick the few people uh who i worked with locally kind of knew what was going on kind of covered for me and said you know he's he's fine yeah um but yeah and it was like you would check them an hour later and there'd be 999 more and it was like like that for a couple of couple of weeks probably because uh you know we had a demonstration every day for the for a solid week and then it was like one every two weeks after that something would come up or something would happen um so yeah it was it was a lot to keep up with because i'm a relatively private person i i post a lot on social media but i don't post a lot about my personal life i don't share what's going on i don't share my work i don't share you know when i'm on vacation and stuff like that so having all those people wanting access to you feels very weird and you start to realize okay there's a lot of eyes on me and this is, it's uncomfortable. Yeah, man. You're over nice celebrity. Asheville's, yeah. Asheville's finest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you were kind of, in a, in a way, you were kind of almost forced into this, uh, this role as Asheville's like top, like media source for, for a lot of these protests. I mean, and, and I'm not exaggerating, like for anyone who, who, who will see this, who doesn't remember um, or can't speak to it that summer in Asheville, like there's a local news affiliate there they would be on the scene reporting for at a protest or a demonstration and there would be people in the facebook live asking where's matt 
Like this this chair, this this reporter you have on camera is whack. Like I want to know where Matt is. Like where's Matt's feed? Are you guys gonna Are you guys gonna switch to Matt's feed? Like where's Matt? And this is this is like a major like local news station, mm-hmm. and people want absolutely nothing to do with with uh, you know their reporters and their journalists. All they wanted was Matt, and mm-hmm. and I think a lot of people who saw the first night when you got hit with gas and you didn't run, you didn't just cut the feed and, you know, be like, Hey guys, you know, I, I can't do this. I'm out. You got, you said you stuck it through because a lot of people couldn't be there, but mm-hmm. a lot of people needed to see what was happening for, for whatever reason when, you know, they, people need to see the news and then make up their own minds, but the news should be like you say, just to kind of present what's happening. Okay. You take what you've mm-hmm. seen and then you make your own determination. Um, and I think that just resonated with a lot of people. And I think at the place we were politically where there's already distrust in like, you know, media and, and big media, mainstream media to see a local guy like you and me who has a nine to five and has zoom meetings <laughs> out of here, you know, risking his health and his life just to record what's happening. I just think that resonated at that particular time with a lot of people. And I think a lot of people appreciated it and you didn't try to force your views. Like you weren't, I mean, I mean, you were, you were talking over the camera, but you weren't like trying to, tell people how they should interpret what they were watching you were just kind mm-hmm. of talking about what was happening as the person who was there mm-hmm. um, and i think that that's it was it's it seems like it should be something so simple but i don't think that's something that's very common and i don't think that a lot of people trust um a lot of places where they might get their news people are doing that they feel like mm-hmm. they're kind of being forced to a to a side whereas you were just like here you go this is it um so yeah, I, I just remember it was crazy, and it was just like demonstration after demonstration after demonstration, and then the views they just they kept going up into the to the thousands, um, and it was just it was just so fascinating. So I mean, you got you got a reputation on Asheville. I mean, you had people looking out for you. You were getting like free like gas oh, yeah. masks, and you were getting pizza, and people were like. I mean, I'm pretty sure somebody asked you to like kiss their baby at some point. <laughs> I was like, like here you go, Matt, kiss kiss my baby. Um, Cause you were just, I mean, you were the guy. So, uh, so from there you kind of, that kind of got you on at a, at a local new, at a radio station. Right. Um, mm-hmm. and that kind of also got you actual press credentials to cover certain events. So talk a little bit about, about those two things. Yeah. I was lucky enough to be contacted by a local radio station. Um, and I think w- what made it so cool is it is a publicly funded radio station, kind of like an NPR style. We're not, uh, we're not fueled by advertisements. Yeah. It's all donation based. Um, 103.7 WPBM FM. Shout out. Voice Nashville. Shout out. Um, and uh, they said, you know, Hey, we want to make sure that you can continue to do this without worrying about things like curfew because Asheville instated a curfew for eight o'clock. So anything after eight, if you didn't have, some kind of media credentials, you were subject to be arrested. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, they understood that I was willing to stay if, as long as I could keep myself safe and keep myself out of jail. Um, so, you know, they reached out to me and they offered me those credentials and said, Hey, we want you to keep doing this. Um, and I think they appreciated kind of what you said. I, I, I really wasn't trying to sway anybody one way or the other. I was just trying to say, Hey, this is what's happening. Yeah. And this is, this is, an unfiltered, unedited, very raw version of what's happening. I'm pretty sure I said a lot of words during my feeds when I was being tear gassed that are not radio acceptable. Right. Uh, but I think because it was so raw and it was so straightforward, um, they really appreciated that as far as the branding of, and the way the radio station is run. Um, so yeah, they, they reached out to me and they, and they helped me with those credentials and made sure that I was kept safe um and uh allowed me to keep going forward yeah and that actually you were actually able to parlay that into a uh you moderated a uh what was supposed to be uh debate for um uh congressional candidates right the 11th. Mm-hmm. For, yeah. yeah i did, actually did a city council debate uh with all five of the people who were up for election um, and then a couple of weeks later, I did what was supposed to be a uh n c eleven debate, but only one of the candidates ended up. Uh, agreeing to it so yeah. uh, basically he and i just kind of discussed his position on a few things and uh yeah. i remember um, i remember that i was so proud i was telling so i was like look look it's your uncle matt it's your uncle matt on the tv <laughs> you know, he's up there talking to big time politicians um 
And it's just so crazy. Like, and I, and I, I, I feel, I don't want to be like a fanboy, but like, like really putting this in, in context and perspective, like you were literally just working and it's not like you were a janitor or anything, but you're just working like a regular, you know, people have jobs mm-hmm. that they work, just working a regular job. And seemingly like literally overnight you became, I would say one of the most important people in the city of Asheville, just because of the access you were giving ordinary people to, to, to very dangerous, violent, but important uh, situations where a lot of those protests mm-hmm. and do you ever just sit back and, and just think like, like, Oh my God, like, summer 2020 was just was just crazy and look at everything that happened like in the wake of it i was able to to get yeah. on the radio station i was able to have live feeds of with 20 you know 15 20 thousand people mm-hmm. um, i spoke to uh candidates for 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 congress you know then for for debates i moderated a town hall um like do you are do you are you ever do you ever sit and just think about that and are you ever like taken aback by it yeah, yeah. I mean, like you said, I was I was just regular in my head, just regular Joe Smo out. I was working nine to five. When I wasn't working, I was at the gym or yeah. spending time with my daughter. So to kind of go to this position where you've got people calling you, um, you've got people messaging you at the this is the slightest hint of something going off in in the area saying, "Hey, are you going to be here?" Yeah. Uh, or or calling me and saying, "Hey, can you cover this event?" Or can you be at this event or do you want to moderate? You know, when I, when I received a message to moderate a congressional debate, it was like me, <laughs> me, yeah. like I'm, I got a zoom meeting tomorrow. I got to be at 10 o'clock. <laughs> you want me to do this? Like, this isn't, this isn't, I'm, I'm yeah. just a guy. Like yeah. I'm just, I'm just can't, a guy. Can't miss those zoom meetings, man. Gotta be with a cell phone and, uh, <laughs> So it was, it was weird uh, to kind of figure out how to balance all that, you know, because yeah. our remote schedule at the time was simple. I mean, you, you made a few phone calls during the day and then you pretty much kind of ran out of work. So yeah. to all of a sudden go from that to being full schedule all the time, you know, I was, yeah. I, I had like radio stations calling me at like 6 a.m. Hey, can you do a seven o'clock? It was like, no, nah, I got to be at work. Yeah. Like, I got to pass. I got a meeting at eight o'clock. I can't do it. Sorry. Yeah. And then to kind of have to balance that, it was, it was tough. It was, it was difficult. And, uh, I really don't think I've still processed all of it to be a hundred percent honest with you. Yeah. Um, might be something to put in the journal. There you go. There you go. Journal about it. Yeah. I mean, it was just, I, I don't, I'll say this last thing and then I'll move on. Cause I'll, I'll talk about it all night. Cause I'm, I mean, just as a friend, um, you know, brother or whatever, uh, I was just so proud. One every night, I was scared something was going to happen to you. So I'm I'm yeah. watching one because of the what you were doing to support you, but also just to make sure you you're able to make it home. But I was just so proud that I think you kept the goal and and the purpose in front of you, and and which is why you kept proceeding to do it. Because I know a lot of people close to you thought it was dangerous. Uh, that you were just doing it for the for the clout, right? Like for the mm-hmm. for the likes and the and the and the friend in the ninety nine nine hundred ninety nine <laughs> friend requests. Um, but I, I speaking to you um, and hearing how like like you, we would have conversations. You're like, dude, I don't know what. Like, I had no idea what was going to happen. Like, I thought that there were a couple instances where I thought like that might have been it, just mm-hmm. because of the craziness that was going on. And you kept going out there, and you talk about like a like a duty, like that was your like your civic yeah. duty to your your fellow citizens to to show them and bring them to have give them a front row seat to what was going on and i was just so proud and like seeing all the things that happened to you because of that courage uh it just it just makes my heart swell because like in my mind it couldn't have happened to a better person because i know uh personally some of the struggles you've had um throughout throughout your life and even um in, in adulthood and it's like you know, it's like, man, like, when's my guy going to catch a break? And then <laughs> I caught a big ass break. Like, <laughs> now, you're, now you're working for yourself and, you know, you, you shaking yeah. hands with politicians. You're working, got all these jobs and interviews and stuff. So I was like, wow, it really happened overnight. So I'm I, I'm honestly a, a, a proud brother and, and fan second. 
And I'm just really grateful that you've kind of been able to, uh, to have this, um, to have this calling, you know, mm-hmm. uh, that you've, that you've stepped into. Uh, and I just, I, I, I just think for like, the sky's the limit in terms of where you go next. So I, I think it's it's just it's just fascinating to watch, and I'm just happy you came out alive, and then also happy you know it it uh, turned out really well for you. So uh, yeah. we'll take one last break. We'll come back. We'll finish up with some things, and then we'll uh, we'll get out of here. So we'll be right back with more with uh, Matt from Maddie Media. All right, so we're back. Rush vibes in the building with uh, Matt from Maddie Media. Uh, we just got done talking about summer 2020 and how he went from uh, serial Zoom attendee to uh, <laughs> a civilian reporter in the Asheville area, uh, and, and is definitely one of the one of the most important people walking around in that city. So, uh, you know, we're coming out of summer 2020, coming out of the fall, coming going past the uh, the, the election, and um, you know the the protests are obviously dying down. Um, news in terms of like uh, campaigns and things are, are kind of slowing down. Mm-hmm. So what was it like between, you know, kind of when at the, after say November, so coming into January, uh, mm-hmm. what was it like between then and now, uh, where you, where you, what you're doing with Maddie media in terms of kind of trying to find, uh, what was next for you as a, you know, as a, um, I don't know, freelancer, entrepreneur or whatever. Yeah. Um, I had partially, back in the back in the loop kind of uh, work schedule so I was trying to balance the two um, I was still picking up a lot of uh, like you said there were other events that would come up there were a couple of uh, other protests after that some of them that got pretty serious um, and then there kind of came the backlash from you know the elections and all of the political kind of discourse yeah. um, so going into this year there was kind of this it was a lull I will say is the best word where uh, I didn't have, there wasn't much going on for me to go cover. It was just basically work. But then there was the realization that I really didn't enjoy, you know, the, the schedule, the nine to five thing anymore. I, I'd kind of fallen in love with uh, not, not the spotlight portion of that per se, but being involved in media and being involved in taking pictures yeah. because I had taken photos of these events as they had happened and I had been sharing those and something in my head just started to kind of eat away. I mean, I was like, Hey, you know, you found this thing that you really like to do. Yeah. You are still dedicating most of your time to this thing that you don't really like to do though. So you know, then there kind of became a transitionary period. What was like, all right, I need to start working towards these other goals. Right. Um, and then, uh, then I made the decision to kind of step away. And, uh, I think in October of last year, I filed, uh, all the necessary paperwork to start a business in the state of North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Um, so I began to start to explore, you know, how to start marketing myself. I created a website, um, you know, the Facebook page, the Instagram page, come up with the branding and learning how to make logos. So you're, you know, I'm spending a week in Photoshop, learning how to use all the tools in Photoshop. And then I'm spending time in Lightroom and I'm spending time on YouTube, learning how to brand and learning how to market and learning how to advertise. And so it became this massive educational experience over the course of six months learning and just it was just information dump i've probably already forgotten more than i've learned (laughs) um you know the last year but it was kind of like hey if i'm gonna do this i need to do it now yeah because you never know when the door is gonna close this is true um i said hey now's the time um so i had that that meeting the uh all right i'm gonna head out meeting (laughs) and uh (laughs) I, I did it. I, I stepped out and uh, I took advantage of of the time, the time that I had available yeah. during COVID and, yeah. and said, hey, I'm going to do this. And uh, I just kind of took a leap of faith on myself and, and made the jump. Yeah. And uh, it's been an up and down ride since then. Sure. Uh, and I think uh, there's a lot of stuff. I think social media, TikTok and Instagram and Facebook, they make it really easy sounding to just hop out and start your own business. Right. Just got to find something you like to do, come up with some logos and a website and boom, you're ready. And you know, there's not a lot of discussion about the real 
uh, grind. Uh, I think a lot of people fall in love with the idea of what it's going to look like when they're successful. Yeah. As a, I'm going to be a successful photographer. I'm going to be a successful videographer. I'm going to be a successful podcaster. And they see the finished product. Uh, and that's what a lot of people will fall in love with. But I, I've sure. learned, especially recently, uh, if you don't fall in love with the stuff they don't talk about, yeah, you're never going to get to the image you have in your head. You've got to fall in love with the paperwork grind. You've got to fall in love with the marketing grind. You've got to fall in love with the handshake grind and the take a no for an answer grind mm. and the, mm. and the, and all the stuff you don't see in the 30 second TikTok videos or the 30 yeah. second Instagram reel. There's a whole lot of stuff in there that if you don't fall in love with it, you're never going to get to, to that, that dream that you had. And, right. uh, I've learned, especially recently, and I think that's where I ended up doing what I'm doing now with the SEO work, because I realized that's a, a grind. Yeah. Sitting down, doing the Google keyword searches, and and going through your website, and checking metadata, and making sure your pictures are tagged, and all that stuff is a grind, but if you fall in love with it, sure, it's fun. It's a lot of fun, and... That was the hardest part. That's what I really, really put a lot of effort into recently because if you love taking pictures, you love doing podcasts, you're going to be good at that, period. Right. You know, because you love to do it. But you've got to you've got to really put the love into the hard stuff that you don't hear about because that's where that's where the the success is going to start. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And oh, I'm going to continue this, but I want to take one. I want to go back. Um, I wanted to go back to the, uh, the protest. So, uh, one thing that I didn't mention that I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear is that you recorded all of these protests on a phone. Like you didn't mm -hmm. come out there with like a, you know, the, the video camera or any kind of rig mm -hmm. or anything. You literally had like a galaxy note, I think. Note 10 plus. Note 10 plus, And you were recapturing everything. And for a while that was your rig. Like you bought some contraptions mm -hmm. and, and hooked it up so that you could, you know, be a little bit more, more agile. Um, but all that was done off a cell phone. So I, I just, you hear all the time people say, oh, we well, don't have to have the fancy gear and blah, blah, blah. And I know a lot of people roll their eyes at it, but it's true. Do turn mm -hmm. into overnight celebrity based off of, uh, I mean, basically just running videos off of a uh, Galaxy Note 10. So mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to put that in there for anybody who's thinking they got to have the, the latest and greatest Sony camera or can't, or, you know, whatever camera. Nah, you can just have the best, the best camera you have is the one that's on you. So yep. that's they're more than likely going to be your cell phone. So, um, so <laughs> I was just laughing at the, the, all right, I'm a head out comment. Um, <laughs> so the, the, the work, right. The grind and the grit. I think that's, I think that's so, so critical for a lot of people to hear because especially now, especially now in the, uh, like you said, in the Instagram era, the TikTok era, the age of the influencer, right. Mm -hmm. Um, you get all these people and they, they seemingly come out of nowhere and they're, you know, and they, and they deserve to be there, right? Like they, they yeah. have this charisma, they have this experience, uh, they're profound with their words. Um, but a lot of times what they, what either what they don't tell you or they don't always say in public is the work and the continuous nose and the, and the, and just mm -hmm. the, the fighting and, and, and scratching and clawing for everything that they can get that led up to that moment. Mm -hmm. um, and when they got that break, they were obviously prepared and met the moment. They didn't shy away from it, which is why they are where, they're, where they are. Um, but it's not very rarely are you going to find someone who just arrives with, with no effort and no, um, mm -hmm. no, no time put in. Cause you just, you just, just kind of the way life works. You got to You got to put your time in. So I love the fact that you, you highlighted that and, and said it. And I think it was so funny. I think I, I shared it with you, the, the TikTok one. <laughs> It's like this person says, I don't want to work a nine to five because I don't want to work all the time or something like that. So I'm going to yep. start my own job. And then they end up realizing that they're working all yep. day because they, they work for themselves. Um, and I'll be honest, as someone who uh, has has dabbled uh, <laughs> with the thought of being an entrepreneur, kind of striking out on my own and doing something, it is a real fear when all you've ever known is someone giving you, basically giving you money every two weeks for a job well done. Um, mm -hmm. and that kind of security, because you, you become a certain level of a professional and you think barring a pandemic or a company reorganization and restructuring, you know, you can kind of count on your place 
and, and yeah. count and count on your, your 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 paycheck to come every two weeks, and it's it's comfortable. It's it's a mm-hmm. safety net, right? So, um, for people who can actually take that, people like you who can actually take that leap and go out and and uh, do what they feel uh, is best for them, what they need to do, I I, I say bravo. I I commend you because I know it's 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 not an easy thing, and I imagine it was it was scary, and still is probably scary. Yeah. Um, because you it's on you to determine mm-hmm. where your where your money is going to come from. So, um, yeah, I think it's great. So what are you doing? Um, what's Maddie media doing now? Like we're, well, we, I know I personally see you on Instagram. You're sharing some amazing photos, um, of, of different things, landscape, landscape shots. Um, I know you did some product shots or, or dabble with some product shots. Um, mm-hmm. but this past summer, you know, you did a really, what I think is a, is a really cool thing. So why don't you talk about, uh, what the summer was like for you and what you did? Yeah, I spent the summer actually traveling uh, with a couple of close friends with Moto America, which is the uh, American professional motorcycle racing. It's the NFL, you know, NBA of motorcycles. Um, Kind of uh, one of those, the door opened and I said, yeah, I'll step through and see what happens kind of things. Um, I don't have a background in motorcycles or anything like that. Um, and uh, some opportunities opened up, and I ended up spending the entire year traveling. I got to go to all uh, all the races, and um, you know, earn some media credentials through Moto America. So I was able to um, meet a lot of other professional photographers and uh, professional motorcycle riders, and and travel the country and go places mm-hmm. I've never been before. Um, you know, uh, rode Atlanta, Virginia. Uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Washington, California, Pittsburgh, New Jersey, Alabama, um, and and add and just kind of add another thing to my resume, um, which was great. Yeah, it was a great opportunity. So, so I do know a little bit more about motorcycles now. I do. I have learned quite a little <laughs> bit about motorcycles um, and and sports photography, which was something I was always interested in, but yeah. never really spent a lot of time in. Um, motorcycles themselves are very tricky to mm-hmm. photograph because there's a fine line between, uh, getting a nice crisp action shot and then having enough motion to show that a motorcycle is moving at 180 miles an hour. So, right. um, when you go from shooting on a tripod or sunrises and sunsets to shooting items that are moving at 160 miles an hour, uh, there's a learning curve and it was, it was steep. Um, but I, I got a chance to meet a lot of great people on the way, picked up some great tips, um, and turned that into a really cool summer. Um, and hopefully, uh, we'll be doing it again next year. Just got approved to be a photographer for the North Carolina high school athletic association. Nice. So, uh, you guys may see me out at some, uh, athletic events coming up over the next few weeks, especially with basketball season coming up. Um, and uh, I'm actually going into my second week of calling high school football games with carolinasportsnut.com. So uh, oh, this yeah. Friday, you can catch me at North Henderson versus Inca High School, 7 o'clock. Um, we'll be uh, commentating uh, that game. So, um, so you're doing, yeah, doing color commentary, huh? How is, yeah, yeah, I'm the color guy. So, <laughs> how, is, how, how has that been for you? What's that like? Uh, it was cool. I did my first game last week. So, uh, you know, trying to get my Gus Johnson on <laughs> and uh, call these high school games and bring a little bit of excitement to uh, to a really good prod- a broadcast. The, the gentleman I'm doing it with has a lot of experience. He's in his 10th year. Um, so it's, again, I'm just lucky to have somebody I can kind of lean on and get tips yeah. from and, and learn from. So, uh, yeah, a lot of stuff uh, unfolding right now. Um and uh, kind of rolling in almost more than I can keep up with. So that's good. It's good to have more work than 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 not enough work, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, so, do you think any? Do you think all of that you're experiencing now, all the opportunities, all the the connections, and all the network, kind of like the COVID question I, I asked for you, would you have made the leap if not for COVID? Do you think any of this would have been possible if you didn't pull out that that smartphone and start recording last summer? Hmm. I'm not sure. Uh, probably not. Like I yeah. said, I, I was content with where I worked. Um, I was content with the work I was doing. I was content with my paycheck and uh, the lifestyle it was offering me at the time. But uh, I'm I'm a lot happier now. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the difference. Um, and I think the that 
the protest coverage and figuring that out about myself and kind of uh, unlocking that door that I had never bothered to knock on before. Uh, definitely, definitely uh, got me where I'm at right now. Yeah, and, and so do you, would you say that you love photography? Is there, is it something that you just really appreciate is how do you feel about it? I mean, because it's basically how you, or, or, what, or probably the, one of the main reasons of, of how you, or main sources of how you, you know, you kind of survive now is, is through your camera. So, I mean, is it something you say now that you, you love, have a passion for, or is it something that you just, you really enjoy and, and have grown to be really good at? Yeah, I would say media in general, um, mm -hmm. all of it. Uh, I've really started to enjoy videography and, and shooting videos as well. Um, so I think just having a camera in my hand um, has become, it's almost synonymous with what I do. Everybody sees me and says, hey, where's your camera? Yeah. Um, I've kind of become that guy everywhere I go. I've got a camera in my hand or I've got my, my gorilla pot out taking videos or I'm shooting yeah. a, a landscape picture here or I'm, you know, 30 minutes before we got on the air, I was out shooting pictures of the moon. There's a beautiful, beautiful full moon tonight. Yeah. Um, so I was out shooting some pictures of that. Um, but I think the array of things that I've done is what is a little different than what a lot of people do. I've chosen kind of, I don't want to stay with just landscapes. I don't want to just do sports. I kind of like mm -hmm. that I can do sports one day and the next day I can do a landscape and then I can go do a portrait and then I can go, you know, shoot whatever the next day. So, uh, um, yeah, I definitely think I love what I'm doing now and, um, hopefully it'll, it'll continue to grow. So oh, I think sure. that will, will help it continue to grow. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm sure it will. So, uh, one last thing, um, you know, I couldn't let you get out of here before we talk about, cause it's not very often. I think you, we've only had like a couple of, of, uh, male guests, uh, but you're the, you're the first girl dad, fellow girl dad. Oh, yeah. that we've uh, that we've had on so you have a beautiful young young daughter um mm -hmm. who i and my wife our family we have a we have a vested interest in obviously uh what is one uh how has this affected your relationship uh with your daughter in terms of your ability to spend more time with her when it's on your time uh and then just talk in general just what it, what it's like for you uh just being a dad uh, especially in today's world, we've got so many things to kind of navigate as a parent coronavirus and, mm -hmm. and then just a, a world that's kind of turning into not the world that, that we grew up in as kids, mm -hmm. you know, just, even just playing out in the front yard with, with neighboring kids. Like you just kind of don't want to do that because you never know who someone, who someone's been around. Um, mm -hmm. So just kind of talk about, you know, what it's like being a girl dad and, and what it's like to kind of parent these days for you. It's a lot. Keeping up with uh, being a parent, while trying to run your own business is uh, very difficult because you can find yourself, it's really easy to find yourself three or four days invested into what you've been doing or a project that's got a timeline. And then, yeah. you know, Oh, I need to, I'm, I'm a dad. It's like, <laughs> Oh, you know, ding, that light comes on. So it's, right. it's a, uh, it's uh, a lot to balance. It's a different type of skill because when you work a regular job, you know, you've got that schedule. I'm done every day at five or six or, whatever that schedule is. And then from that point on, it's, it's family time. So to have that change of pace, uh, is definitely, it's, it's, it's good and bad. You've got to make sure you're aware of those balances and, um, making sure that you don't forget your parent first. Yep. You know, you're, I'm not, I'm not the media guy who has a daughter, a daughter. I'm a, I'm a dad who does media and, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's hard to remember that sometimes and I'm not perfect. Um, but it's, uh, it's a lot, it's a lot to balance, but it's one of those things that you have to calculate into making that decision. Um, and like you said, I do enjoy being able to say, Hey, I'm busy today. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm going to be with my daughter. I can't take this project on versus having to put in a PTO request or, you know, ask for permission to be off early because I need to go to a dance recital or something. Now I can pick up and say, Hey, I've got to be at cheerleading at five o'clock. Yeah. I'll talk to you when I'm done or I'll, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Right. So uh, it's, 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 you know, it takes balance like everything else does when you're working on your own. It takes a lot of balance and a lot of uh, focus. And, and like you said, the world's a lot different today than it was when we were growing up. Um, uh, it's a lot more 
favorable for women. I see a brighter future for her and women's rights and, and movements and things that are being pushed even today, you know, with uh, more continued protests and, and things like that, um, equal pay, you know, and the future, I think, is very bright. And knowing that the doors for women are open more now so than they've ever have been before, I think is is very promising and that makes me really proud to see that my daughter is going to grow up in, in a world where she can do whatever she wants to, whenever she wants to. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, that's, that's a plus, but at the same time, you know, the world is changing a lot and it's a dangerous place, maybe more so than it was when you and I were growing up. So there's a lot yeah. to, to remember and, and keep in the back of your head um, and, and making sure you're having those conversations with your kids and, um, let them know you're there. Um, cause the world is, is a lot to keep up with. And, um, I think the background in mental health is a big deal too. And, and I'm always kind of checking in and asking, you know, how are you feeling? What's your, you feeling stressed? Are you feeling anxious? And kind of having those conversations that maybe you and I didn't have growing up because it wasn't such a hot topic yeah. are important. So. Cool. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Um, I agree with absolutely everything you said um, and, and second it as well. So I'm going to give you two minutes. Uh, you don't have to take two minutes, but I'm going to give you two minutes um, and just kind of give uh, people um, anything that we didn't cover that you feel is important, anything that maybe you thought of during our conversation uh, that you kind of just want to share with people or, or words of wisdom to impart or any advice on anyone who's, you know, maybe toiling with the idea of becoming, taking that leap, becoming an entrepreneur, be it in photography, videography, media, or, or something else. So I'll, I'll give you the floor and kind of let you go where you feel led. Uh, yeah, I would say right now for me, the big thing that I try to chime in everybody is if you're going to work on your, on your own, you're going to take that leap. Um, don't fall in love with the end picture of success. Don't fall in love with the picture of you with the big bank account and the nice house and the nice cars. Don't fall in love with the idea of the million followers um, and the hundreds of thousands of views and all that stuff. Fall in love with the midnight to 2 a.m. grind session sitting in front of YouTube. Fall in love with the paperwork sessions. Fall in love with the the practice, fall in love with all the stuff that you're not going to hear about from a person in a position of success, because if you don't, it'll eat you alive. It will, it will eat you up. It will consume you because if you're only focused on that picture, which I can, I can tell you from experience, I, I was, as soon as I decided I was going to do it, I was like, I'm going to have a million followers tomorrow. I'm going to, I'm going to blow up. I'm going to get millions of views. My posts are thousands of likes and it's not going to happen. Yeah. It's not, it's just not, you know, there's one and 10 million people that happens to, you've got to fall in love with day by day. You've got to be able to look at everything you're doing and say, Hey, this isn't working. This is working and criticize yourself in such a way where you're not being hard on yourself. You're just being honest, be honest with yourself, be honest with the people around you and build a, build a team. You need a team. It takes a team, you know, having somebody like you that I can call and chat with and bounce ideas off of and sometimes just express failures and say, Hey man, this is, this has been a bomb week. Yeah. Uh, it's important. You know, um, going into business for yourself is not a one man show, one woman show. It is a team effort. It is a group effort. It is, uh, it takes a community. Um, and if you're going to do it, you've got to, You've got to change your mindset. Don't look at the end. Look at the steps and fall in love with those steps. Because if you don't, your your big dream picture is never gonna. It's never gonna come to. So, um, fall in love with the grind. Fall in love with the day by day. Um, and and learn to be content where you are on a day to day basis because that's the only way you'll be successful. Um, and if that was the advice I was gonna give, I think that's the advice I'd give to everybody. Damn, did you did you prepare that or was that all off the? Off, off the cuff, cuff, man. Off the cuff. My goodness. Um, well, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna taint that at all. I'm not gonna touch it. Um, it was fire, and it was very, very appropriate. So I'll leave it at that. Um, where can people find you on social media and, and on the internet? 
Uh, Instagram, you can find me at maddie.media, uh, same as Facebook, Maddie Media on Facebook. Um, you can check out my website, maddie-media.com. Um, and uh, I'm always posting. I'm always around. Feel free to reach out and shoot a message. Um, and I'm always looking to add more work. So, Awesome. All right. Well, brother, I appreciate you. You know, Jess appreciates you. Uh, Silas appreciates you. And <laughs> Sovereign, uh, Sovereign, actually, after uh, last weekend. Um, we, we now know appreciate you as well. So, um, thanks for coming on. Like I said, we've been trying to do this for as long as we've, this podcast has been a thing. Um, unfortunately we weren't able to have Matt here in person, but, uh, I appreciate you making time on, on such short notice, uh, to, to finally just get on here. I finally said, all right, we're going to do it. Like we're just, we're just going to do it. We'll do it live. We'll do I'll it live. Back. We're going to do it. So, uh, and, and Matt made himself available. So we appreciate you, man. We love you. Um, thanks for coming on and I'm sure we'll have you back on at, at, at some point. Um, to everybody who's, who's watching online or listening, uh, be sure to uh, subscribe if you haven't. I know we don't give the audio portion of the podcast a lot of love, but that's important, too. Uh, we appreciate all our listeners just as much as we appreciate our viewers and our subscribers. We're all, all of you guys are a part of the Vibe Tribes. We appreciate you all equally. Uh, but if you haven't, be sure to go ahead and leave a review. Uh, we appreciate the, as many stars as you can give, but, it, you know, feel whatever we give, whatever you feel like we deserve as well. Uh, connect with us on social media. We're at Rush Vibes on Facebook and on Instagram. Um, and go ahead, be sure to hit that subscribe button and the like button. Helps to show up in the algorithm uh, for content that's similar to ours so that we can kind of expand our reach. We are coming toward the tail end of season one of Rush Vibes. We have maybe one or two more episodes at most in us. So we appreciate everybody who's been along for the ride. Uh, we're just getting started. We are going to take a little bit of a pit stop. Uh, to, to help usher in new baby rushing, uh, but then we'll be back before you know it. So I'm going to go ahead and bring Jay Belk in. Don't know how many more times we're going to get to hear this before we take a break, so I'm just going to appreciate the, the melodies for a second. Matt, we appreciate you. Um, guys, please be safe, um, be well, and we will likely see you next week. We out. I done came way too fucking stop me now. I done came way too fucking stop me now. Stop me now, stop me now, yeah, I done came way too far.